I would like to thank the 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 ITE and WTS FAU student chapters that they are helping us to um, helping us with the fMRI the frame mobility Research Institute a webinar series that uh, we try to have it uh, twice per month. I would like to thank every to thank everyone that took time from the, your schedule to attend the, another webinar. It's the last one in March. That uh, we are uh, really honored to have Dr. Leticia de Blanc, uh, uh, that she is a professor at the University of Gustave Eiffel. I fell in Paris. And uh, thanks. Uh, she also has the Logistics City Chair and is member of Metro Freight, an international network of research on urban freight. Uh, I have met uh, Dr. LaBlanc in many conferences, and uh, she is doing research also with the various universities in collaboration in the United States and Europe. Dr. LaBlanc leads the Young Initiative of the World Conference for Transport Research Society. Also, his areas, uh, her areas of research are freight transportation, freight and environment, urban freight and logistics, freight policies, and special issues related and logistics. Uh, after her presentation, Alini is going to coordinate the question and answer um, session. We are going to inform you with the next FMRI webinar. And uh, Dr. Dablanc, uh, thank you again that you are part of the webinar, FMRI webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Evangelos. Shall I start? Please, please. How much time do I have? <clears throat> usually, usually the, the, the webinars are 35 to 40, 45 minutes. But it's up to you. You would like to finish earlier or a little bit, little bit later. OK? And after that, we, Aline is going to, you know, to handle the discussion. OK, good. So, hi everyone. I'm very happy to share some of our results. And this is, uh, I picked the, st the, 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 the topic gig workers for delivery platforms because we just finished a big um, field survey and we interviewed um, 500 gig workers for delivery platforms such as Uber Eats in Paris. So, <clears throat> Very interesting new results to share. And it's actually the first time I, I show these results. I really just received them from um, the team that made the interviews. <clears throat> so just a little word about um, our team. Um, so that's the Logistics City Chair from the University Gustav Eiffel. I had that um, team. Um, we have uh, postdocs and colleagues. And we all are urban planners, economists, geographers, so social sciences working on urban freight and city logistics. <clears throat> we have a specificity, which is we look at warehouses too, urban warehouses. We look at innovations, new trends in consumption, e-commerce, of course, and impacts on city logistics. And we have lots of results available online. We just put online a new website, which is called e-commerce mobilities observatory. And it's really open to everyone. And we want to discuss e-commerce mobility data and the problem with data and how to get new data on uh, these mobilities, urban freight mobilities for the B2C um, market. We also just put out our survey reports on gig workers. So the last one is really recent. We had um, results on urban logistics and the first French um, COVID lockdown. And we also just put online some uh, results about warehousing in 74 large cities around the world and their relationships with um, urban form size of cities and density. So all of this is on the website. So our uh, gig workers, I just want to introduce gig workers for delivery platforms with a little bit 
about urban freight labor market. So it's a um, very traditional labor market, and it's also a new labor market. Basically, it's an easy job market to access, as you know, uh, difficult working conditions, not very high salaries, of course. To uh, a, 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 an urban region like Paris, which is about 12 million people, right? Um, it's 500 people working in warehousing and freight transport. So it's actually a lot of the job market for uh, even um, a capital like, like Paris. Again, I'm talking about the urban region, not the city of Paris, which is just one city in the center of the region. The region is 12 million people. Um, such a region is about 12,000 small freight transport companies in total. And many of them are the contractors of the large operators like, like UPS or DHL. Um, so that's about what the market represents, delivery companies. But the new thing is self-employed couriers. And it's about 2,000 new micro companies every month just to fill out that new market of um, the delivery gig economy. Uber Eats, Deliveroo, and a few other companies, just to give you um, a basic number. And that was in 2018, sorry, 19. And the pandemic has further increased the number of gig workers. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the exact data yet, but it's probably double. Okay, so every month, probably between three to 4,000 new micro companies for instant deliveries are created in, uh, in, uh, in the region of Paris. So that's what we're going to talk about. These new markets, these are not small companies like the ones I mentioned before. These are not employees working in warehouses or bigger companies. These are independent gig workers, right? But in France, they have to have a sort of status and it's called a micro company. They need to be a micro company in order for them to work for Uber Eats or the other companies. So that's how we can uh, monitor the numbers. Okay, so another niche is growing in terms of um, companies in delivery in Paris. These are the cyclo cycle logistics using cargo cycles. So you see that, right? Um, I, I took the photos myself in Paris very recently. That's UPS, that's uh, Star Service, a local company. That's the Post Group, a big company in France. They are all using cycle container-based um, um, cargo cycles in a way. That's a niche, but that's a very interesting niche because it's growing very fast. So these basically are not gig workers. They are employees of bigger companies like, of course, UPS or La Poste. I, but I just want to mention that there is this new market too, okay, in cycle logistics. The container-based uh, uh, bicycles. And what I'm going to talk about, the gig workers, they are not using these types. They are using uh, the, the regular bikes and they are also using a lot of mopeds. So lots of innovation in these delivery uh, markets. And we're going now to focus on one, which is the instant delivery market. So on-demand instant delivery services. And how I define them is deliveries in two hours, everybody using smartphones and being interfaced by digital platforms and the platforms using independent workers, self-contractors, gig workers, okay? It's a world phenomenon. This is Lima, Peru, this is Mumbai, India, this is London, this is Buenos Aires, Argentina. Same sorts of platforms are providing instant deliveries to people living in cities. It started with a big, very big cities, and now it is in the medium-sized cities all around the world. <coughs> Sorry, it's growing very fast. Uh, just a, 
quick word about crowdsourcing versus instant delivery gig work. I'm uh, making the distinction between pure crowdsourcing and regular crowdsourcing. Pure crowdsourcing would be the use of private persons, available transport capacity. When these private persons are on the way to work or on the way to school or on the way to shopping. So it's trying to take advantage of the transport capacity of people when they are moving around the city. And some applications, some apps have tried that. DHL MyWays was an interesting start. Um, that's European Shopper Pop. Uh, that's actually a US new service from Geodis, Geodis City Delivery. It is trying to use people's mobility to make deliveries, right? But it is a very small niche of the whole instant delivery uh, service. The regular crowdsourcing and the regular instant delivery market is the use of private persons who are dedicated to the delivery activity. They are not doing something else. They're going to make a delivery. And they are not going you know, to work or to school or at, in the same trip. And that's what has developed. So there are really two different sorts of markets. One is actually what's happening. People are dedicated to the de delivery activity and one has not really uh, taken up the pure crowdsourcing. Just a brief uh, word to tell you what I'm looking at. Okay, so instant delivery platforms. We have um, giants today around the world. We have world brands. Prime now from Amazon, Uber Eats. They are world brands because they are uh, trying to get into as many urban markets as uh, they can. They are very strong US brands. Uh, Grubhub, which has just been bought by Just Eat, which is a European brand from um, the Netherlands. Uh, Postmates, now it's part of Uber. Instacart, DoorDash, you know them, of course. They are very big Chinese brands like Meituan. Latin American brands, Rappi, iFood, and European brands, Foodora, Delivery Hero, uh, Deliveroo, which is UK. It's going on an IPO um, in a few days. That's the largest European one. Glovo is, is a Spanish one, and a few French ones that are smaller, so I didn't mention them here. And what's interesting is that there are many, many domestic brands including many startups, and that's in all regions of the world. So in all cities around the world, basically, in all the regions, in Africa, in uh, Southeast Asia, Latin America, you have local brands too. So really, um, it's a very, very dynamic market, I would say. So a few facts, a few indicators from uh, the past uh, few months. So I mentioned Deliveroo IPO soon in London. A very big starting valuation of the company, but a little less um, <clears throat> as expected before, because large investors have been hesitant over the bad publicity, over workers' rights, and and also some specificities about the company. But I I will go back to that issue of the legal status of the gig workers. Uh, it's been discussed in many countries today. And for Deliveroo, it is slightly uh, reducing the market value for the upcoming IPO. So it's, I think it's worth mentioning that it has an impact on uh, the financial uh, future of these, uh, of these new types of companies. Valuation of Meituan, the Chinese one, is extremely big. As you can see, it's the biggest, largest in the world. Postmates was bought by Uber for... 2.65 billion dollars. Uber Eats, and that's the impact of the pandemic, increased 130% their uh, bookings, their deliveries over the last year. DoorDash, even more so. So really the pandemic has increased the market more than double. In the case of DoorDash, it tripled the market. And it's the same everywhere very big increase of, of course, 
meal deliveries, but it's not only meals anymore. It can be grocery, it can be parcels. So these companies are extending uh, their uh, specific uh, goods, the goods they are delivering from meals to anything related to parcels today. And as I was saying, there's uh, lots of things happening on the legal front, especially in the, <clears throat> in the US and in Europe. So the High Court of Spain just uh, recently um, decided that a worker is actually an employee. Um, Uber in the UK is going to give workers a uh, status. Um, and so they're not fully independent anymore. They will have more benefit. You know what happened with California law AB5. There was a referendum in California and um, Proposition 22 was successful. So the, the, the legislation was abandoned. The legislation was um, trying to turn all the gig workers into employees. And something like that happened in France with the highest court deciding that workers are actually employees because of economic depend dependency. And in France, there are 400 cases in court at the moment in, for the same um, issues. So really big issues in court related to uh, the status, the legal status of the gig workers and some changes towards a sort of intermediate position between independent and employees. That's what the situation in the UK exemplifies. And also something happening is that there are alternative delivery platforms, very, very small in terms of market share. They are trying, and they're very costly actually to run, but they are trying to be more socially and environmentally conscious. For example, one, Urbit, is trying to make deliveries only by foot, by bike or public transport. So no mopeds, no cars. They give better pay and they try to hire more women. And other companies are trying to set up cooperatives. So they're not strictly uh, speaking platforms, but they are a uh, sort of different uh, organization. So these are niches, but they are growing actually. Small market share, but they're growing. Okay, so now the gig worker surveys we've been doing in Paris. So we've been doing that in since uh, five years ago. And we have a sort of um, field methodology. We're going on the field. It's random encounters. And we have about 500 people interviewed. Why do we do that? There's no other way, actually, because we don't have the basis to make a sample. We don't know the basic population of gig workers. We have to start from scratch. And we don't want to do um, social media um, survey or Facebook surveys, for example, uh, that can be popular. But because you miss a lot of these people if you do um, online surveys. So you really have to go on the field. And you have to make sure that everybody really uh, answers to your questionnaire, which is actually not that hard because these workers are waiting. Many, many of that, much of that time is spent waiting in the street for a gig. And they are actually quite willing to answer a questionnaire. So we were quite lucky in getting a sort of random encounter, but we think it's quite representative of the actual population of the gig workers. One interesting uh, result from these surveys over time is the main change of the gig worker from part-time and mostly students. This is what you find in orange here. That's for 2016 and that's for 2020 and 2021. These are the students, part-time delivery workers, and now they're full-time. That's the blue area. So full-time workers, um, came from 22% to 70%. So really now most of them are full-time workers. But there is a little change in 2021. As you can see, the student population has grown. 
And it's probably because so many restaurants have shut down in um, 2020 <laughs> that the students that had some jobs had to turn to um, delivery, instant delivery, because they couldn't do their, their jobs in the restaurant uh, market as they did before. So there's probably an impact on the pandemic here. But for the most part, what happened is that we, that's a market that started with uh, part-time gig workers and ended up with uh, full-time workers. <clears throat> and basically that's also a change from students to full-timers to migrants. So I'm, uh, I'm going a little bit out of the French survey here but I'm taking uh, research works from elsewhere and I'm comparing uh, what happened in Europe to what happened in other countries. And now it is a sort of uh, opportunity for jobs for people who have problems with documentation and documented migrants in Paris are a part of uh, the population doing these works. Same in Latin America with a lot of refugees from Venezuela. Um, in Chinese cities, it can be rural migrants, right, doing these sort of jobs. And overall, these changes are linked to decreasing earnings, uh, decreasing pay from the platforms. So there's a general trend, I would say, De slightly decreasing pay and then opening up to new sorts of uh, workers especially migrants, refugees, rural migrants. So it's an interesting global trend, I would say. Okay, so the Paris survey, the very new results. Uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to comment on this one, which is full of numbers, just for your record. We're going to look at a few of them in detail in the next slides, but let, let me just uh, show you the first number. So it's 93% men, 7% women. And that's actually higher for women compared with the previous survey. So women are actually entering the market. And I think it's also because of this COVID impact, the pandemic impact on uh, students. Many student, um, women students entered the market because they couldn't work in restaurants and bars anymore. Um, we asked them for which platforms they were working. So most of them were working for Deliveroo and Uber Eats. So which are the main two players for France? And then Just Eat, Stewart, Fridge Tea, Glovo, which are smaller European platforms. But what was surprising to me was that only 11% of the respondents work for multiple platforms. And before that was a higher number. So I think the market has increased so much that now they can stay with one platform. They get enough gigs, staying with only Uber Eats, for example, or only Deliveroo, and not switching back and forth from one platform to another. Interesting uh, numbers about delivery vehicles. <clears throat> In 2016, gig workers were most of them using bicycles in Paris to make the deliveries. And then this share of the bicycles decreased. Now it's only half of them. So half of these deliveries are made by bicycles. Oh, by the way, they are supposed to use bicycles. In France, the legislation does not let them use a motor vehicle like a moped or a car, but many of them are using them. And there's not much control by um, the police, actually. But they are in an illegal situation when they are using mopeds. So increasingly much higher use of motor vehicles because they need to go faster in order to get more gigs and to compensate for the decreasing earnings. Interestingly, there's an increase in the use of new modes so what I'm referring um, in terms of new modes is uh, bike sharing, scooter sharing, electric bike sharing. These are schemes that are very developed in Paris. And a lot of these uh, delivery workers are using the bike sharing scheme, Vélib, in Paris. It's actually not allowed either. 
you're not supposed to make deliveries using the bike share, the public bike sharing scheme. But many of them are uh, using it because it's very cheap and very practical for them. And there's no risk of getting the bike stolen, which is a major problem for when you have your own bike. Commuting to the workplace, that's where they live. Actually, many of them live in Paris, 59%. And many of them live in the poor suburban area of the north of Paris, or 23%. We were interviewing them when they were working in the eastern part of Paris. So how do they get to work, which is how do they get to the eastern part of Paris? 62% were using the vehicle they use for deliveries. So if they use a bike, they come by bike or they use the moped to, or their car <clears throat> to get to uh, the, the work. But 16% are coming in public transit and they have to carry their bike in the trains. Quite a complicated thing to do in Paris. Very dense uh, transit uh, system. So it's difficult to get your bike into the trains on the metro. 13% are coming in public transit with no bike. So they are using the bike sharing system on site. Some um, operational like financial indicators. Uh, sorry, maybe too many numbers, but I was excited in discovering the, the numbers um, earlier um, um, yesterday. So I put a lot of these numbers here. So basically they're doing 18 deliveries a day in average. They cover 42 kilometers. Many of them work a lot. 40% work six days a week, 17% work even seven days a week. And many of them work more than eight hours a day. 40% are satisfied with what they earn, which means 60% are not. And you have the average earnings here. Basically, they earn um, um, a um, minimum wage, more or less. The challenges of the job, so they find the relationships with the clients and the restaurants actually difficult. And that actually went up from previous surveys. So they need to go quicker and quicker and people, they don't think people and restaurants respect their work. They have to wait in the restaurants or they don't get enough tips from the consumers, etc. But they also find the relationships with the platforms very difficult. They don't understand the algorithm. They don't understand why they can be put out of the, of the service. For example, um, they want more and better relationships with, uh, with the platforms. <clears throat> in, in, an interesting number is that half of them find that there are too many gig delivery workers available compared with the number of delivery gigs. Again, that comes back to what I was saying before. The pandemic has increased the need for uh, these gigs, and many, many people have registered to these companies, many more than the previous years. So now they're competing for delivery gigs. The delivery gigs have increased, but not as much as the number of people available to do them. 70% find that there are higher safety risks to their activity. And many of them already have had an accident. On the plus side, 77% of them enjoy the independence and working whenever they want, the, the flexibility of the job, right? 50% imagine themselves, themselves still at the same kind of job in one year, which is actually a high number. It was not the same uh, in the previous surveys. And a third of the respondents were motivated to become delivery worker because of the pandemic. Again, very strong impact of COVID on um, the supply of these gig workers in Paris. I uh, just want to finish with a few um, considerations in terms of a uh, little bit more like urban planning and what these new markets are generating for cities, very briefly. Uh, as you may know, the restaurants that are involved in these uh, instant deliveries have started to rent 
shared kitchens or dark kitchens, which means you don't make the food only from your restaurant, but you also rent spaces outside of the urban uh, of the city center. Uh, and you have your employees making the food, but it's not open to the public. So it's a second kitchen, right? Because there are so many deliveries. You have to make so many deliveries that it makes more sense to actually generate the meals, prepare the meals in another place. And that became a business. So delivery editions, kits, cloud kitchens, these are new names of companies providing space in the cities, especially in the closed suburban areas, to uh, make meal preparation for the restaurants. Um, an interesting case also is Frishti in Paris. They have kitchens in the suburb, but they also have 10 hubs that you can see here on the map. That's the city of Paris. Really. And Frishti has organized 10 hubs so that they can make deliveries in less than 20 minutes. So there's suburban kitchens, dark kitchens, providing with a very sophisticated uh, way of knowing um, the fulfillment uh, requirements for the hubs. So the kitchens provide the meals and then from the hubs, the delivery um, people will be able to deliver in less than 20 minutes, the consumers in Paris. So that's a sort of complicated set of new types of um, little hubs, logistics hubs within the city centers and the suburban kitchens. So that's uh, something I picked from Cloud Kitchens, for example, and they explain their uh, business model. And they call that the ghost kitchen, suburban kitchen, uh, to um, as an addition to the restaurant. Uh, another interesting development is, of course, Amazon Prime now. They have these uh, very urban little fulfillment centers to be able to deliver in one or two hours. So it actually means that there are Amazon terminals right in very, very uh, city centers. Uh, examples here, this is the center of Barcelona, that's the Amazon hub. This is in Santa Monica, this is Manhattan. This is the one in Paris, this is the one in Madrid. All of these are freight terminals right back into city centers. Again, that makes Amazon Prime now available in one or two hours for the final uh, consumer. So there is an little, a sort of impact for urban planners because they have to accommodate for these new urban warehouses in city centers, in very, very expensive areas of these um, uh, cities, actually. And another impact, that's a, a, a sort of, it's another type of warehousing, urban warehousing from Amazon. That's not only Prime now, it's Prime in general. But as you know, Amazon has, 15 more or less 15 warehouses in los angeles and same in many big cities across the us they have urban warehouses right v much smaller than the big ones in the suburban areas but they do have a selection of the goods in high demand but what i'm interested in and i'm taking uh, the work from miguel Jalier here because his team was able to count the number of vehicles that were coming in and out of these urban warehouses. And I just want to point out that these warehouses generate actually a lot of traffic right within, and for example, in that case, that's uh, photos I took from Los Angeles, and Miguel was taking the, the numbers from Sacramento, but right from uh, warehouses located within city centers, you have a lot of traffic. That traffic is lorry traffic to supply the warehouses, delivery vans to make deliveries, but also to supply in terms of spot um, supply when there's some goods missing. But a big part of the traffic generated by these urban warehouses is flex cars and flex cars are 
the cars from the private individuals that are on Amazon Flex. So that's the app uh, set up by Amazon to use uh, people's driving and people's willingness to make some delivery tours um, once or twice a week. And the sheer number of the cars for one warehouse was actually amazing to me. That's 800 flex cars one day for just one example of a warehouse. So that means in each of these 15 warehouses that, that you can find all across Los Angeles, you have more than 1,000 vehicles coming in and out every day and using um, the residential uh, parking uh, facilities because there's not much space within these warehouses. Lots of parking is actually happening outside. So an interesting example of what it can mean for uh, cities in terms of this new market of instant deliveries. So um, brief conclusion on gig workers and instant deliveries. Um, <clears throat> huge turnovers of delivery couriers. I didn't mention that before, but it's really a market where it's difficult to get people stay longer than six months in the job. So it's a very key characteristic of that market, of that labor market. Business models adapt constantly. Many, many partnerships with these, uh, between these instant delivery platforms with the big players. Uh, Amazon and Deliveroo, for example, now are connected. Um, Carrefour is connected to Uber Eats in France. So new partnerships because these delivery platforms need to uh, grow and need to survive first. They're not, doing, they're not making much margin, uh, profit margins. So they need to survive and to grow. So they make a lot of partnerships with um, grocery players, for example, and other types. Access to investors is key. You need to grow when you're not making a profit. So you need investors. Emerging issues. So I mentioned full-time workforce and the legal issues associated with that. Remember, I told you that Deliveroo was actually not valued as much as it could be because investors are a little bit afraid of the legal issues related to the status of the gig workers. Um, unions are trying to get into that market, but there's not much interest from the gig workers in terms of getting into a union or a sort of um, collective uh, association. Uh, they want their independence, in, I would say. It's really... Um, independence-minded sort of uh, business um, market. Increased illegal work in France through the use of motorbikes, mopeds, sharing of licenses and accounts. But on the bright side, it really brings a lot of opportunities for jobs for low-skilled uh, people in city centers. And city centers um, before tended to lose low-skilled jobs. So it's a way of putting back low-skilled jobs in city centers in these big, sophisticated cities like Paris or New York. I think there's a huge potential for training these people so that they can actually have a real career in freight and logistics. These tens of thousands of um, delivery workers uh, could be actually lured into staying into the freight career. So there's an opportunity for um, trade, uh, freight trade associations and training agencies to get them and train them. Um, use of new modes, as I mentioned, um, it's not always um, legal. They're using bike sharing, but um, it could actually be an opportunity for cities to, for example, increase the use of electric mopeds. That could be a trade-off. French cities could tell these people, okay, you're not supposed to use mopeds, but you are. So at least you should try to use electric mopeds and it will increase the use of electric mopeds in, in Paris or in Lyon. And there's an interesting trend in terms of the, grow, the growth of more socially responsible platforms, platforms that pay more 
uh, for the delivery uh, work. And that's what I had, so I'm now open for any question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Leticia, for your great presentation. Um, it was interesting to see how the, the perspective of gig workers who are now so valuable do it due to the current restrictions. Um, we will now be taking the questions from the audience and you may either unmute yourself or type the question in the chat. So I will start with the first question, if you don't mind. Um, I wanted to ask you if companies that manages the platforms that you investigated are interested on in using the conclusions and the insights from this study to incorporate and improve their platforms. I, I wouldn't go that far, um, but we met with Uber Eats and Deliveroo and they were in, they were, that was the, the 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 last year when we did the 2020 survey and they were actually taking notes and but so many other things are important for them basically legislation from the national labor code that's what's important to them but they took notes and they were interested in the metrics that we had because they didn't have exactly the same and they were interested in the challenges that uh, the the, the respondents uh, raised in terms of their the thing they didn't like, the things they liked about their job. So yeah, they took notes, let's say. Thank you. Um, I have one question from the audience in the, the chat. How are e-bikes classified? And Ali, let me just clarify, that was regarding that when you were talking, Leticia, about the um, shift from bikes to scooters. I was wondering if you're classifying e-bikes in the bicycle category or if you're classifying as a motor vehicle. Definitely bicycle. E-bikes have a bicycle status, which means you can use them without any legal issues. And uh, you can use the bike lanes. Um, but yes, they're definitely bicycles. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Yes, I, I have a question. I don't know if this was addressed in the beginning of the of the presentation. Um, but regarding the training of the of the gig workers to perhaps seek a greater career in in fright, um, is there any policy in place in terms of training these said individuals? given the fact that you know they do work as you said seven days a week sometimes eight hours a day or more and so is there a specific way of uh training them uh when they do have these uh rigorous schedules thank you yeah that's a good point they wouldn't have time to go through training sessions but I think we don't even try so I think these agencies I, I talked about that we have big educational agencies that actually are targeting um, low-skilled workers to propose careers. They are not yet much looking around and trying to reach out to these uh, workers. I think they should. And in that case, we are talking with them and we have uh, alerted them to the opportunity they could have. So maybe that will change. In that case, we may make a difference. Um, but. And then I guess they will find more time if they are interested in their schedule, but that's that will be tough because they want to earn their 1500 euros a month, right? That's the average. Uh, and they have to do that through more and more gigs. So that's a problem. It's much more than eight hours um, um, a day for, for a third of them. It's more than that. So it can go all the way to 12, uh, 13 hours a day. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I don't see any other questions here. Dr. Kaiser, would you like to say some final words? Maybe we could finish earlier. That's okay. Uh, we would like to thank everyone that uh, participated uh, uh, um, in this uh, um, great webinar.
uh, uh, Dr. Dablanc, thank you that you shared recent findings with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, we are looking forward to see you in uh, fMRI um, virtual event or in person. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, Aleni, thank you that you put this together with other members from the um, student chapters. And I'm looking forward, you know, um, uh, to see if we have any other question before we will dismiss for today. Any other question for the audience before? I received two questions here after you started talking. I'm sorry. Okay, 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 Lily. Um, one question is: Have you been using drop-off centers or hubs for di distribution in city centers for workers to distribute? Okay, I'm sorry. I don't understand the question. Have you been using drop-off centers or hubs for distribution in city centers for workers to distribute? Well, actually, a few of these companies are using hubs. Yes, definitely. It's a trend. They really need to go faster now. So they need to guarantee a delivery in 20 minutes. You do that if you have sufficient uh, hubs because restaurants are not enough. You want the specific good that people want um, at the at the local um, in the na local neighborhood. So they do implement networks of hubs now. It's an interesting new trend. And some companies are actually helping delivery platforms to find hubs, uh, find um, opportunities. Um, for example, closed boutiques because of COVID. So they turn that into sort of logistics uh, hubs for, for prepared meals. Interesting development. I have one other question. If you see e-commerce growing in the future, um, regardless of the pandemic. Maybe not as much as in 2020, of course, but definitely more than in 2019. So I think it has accelerated um, the uptake of e-commerce, especially in demographics that didn't use it before, um, senior citizens or um, far suburban um, people who didn't use that much um, online shopping, so now they do. So I think that's not going to go back as normal. I think it has the the, the pandemic has set up a trend of acceleration of the uptake. Um, I have one other question. What urban planning interventions are necessary for emerging gig workers? Well, local governments cannot do much in terms of the status of these workers, um, but they can. Many big cities actually have training agencies. So I think on, in that particular uh, topic, the training and providing careers to these people, uh, I think they could do a lot. They can also help with that um, developing the use of electric moped. I think it's a key area of uh, reduction of uh, pollution in cities, especially in Europe. Lots of mopeds, lots of motorcycles for passenger mobility and for freight mobility. And there's very, very little uh, development of electric mopeds or motorcycles. It's very different from urban China, for example. So I think. In that case, local governments could help promote the use of electric mopeds, especially for the delivery business. Thank you. Um, Jacob, would you like to, to join the, the discussion and um, ask your question directly? Oh, hello. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just repeat what I put in the chat. Uh, mainly, who is responsible for using the correct vehicles? So I have to thank you for the presentation. You talked a lot about the mopeds. Is there a way that we can have the companies do this enforcement rather than putting the burden on that of that enforcement on you know local? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. Well, you actually um, these companies are supposed to watch out for the use of mopeds and motorcycles because it is illegal in France to use them if you are a micro company, 
you need another sort of license. And these companies, these platform companies are supposed to look at the paperwork, but they are not doing their job. So actually, yes, they should be obliged to enforce the requirements. That's the first step, right? And they're not doing that right, uh, right now. So yes, there could be a very big improvement in that area. But I actually think that maybe we should also change the rules. I do think these um, delivery jobs actually need mopeds. It's not a bad thing. The problem is the mopeds we use are just very polluting. So if we change that, we should just let them use them. It's much, um, it can be more convenient. It's the choice of the delivery people to use a moped or a bicycle. That's the, that should be their choice. So we should probably change the legislation. Thank you, I haven't considered that, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. The, um, if anyone has it, you can unmute yourself. Um, but, but if we don't, I would like to, yeah. yes, all right. I'd like, oh, yeah. like to speak, hi. Um, I'm speaking from New York City. Um, I work for the New York City Department of Transportation. I know Cornell University is conducting a survey with delivery cyclists. Um, they are looking to interview 500 people. Oh, interesting. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes. If you have more information or contact, I would be very interested. Yes, uh, let's keep in touch. Um, also, a little bit concerned about the labor implications with the platforms and I'd like to ask you, I know you mentioned something about right now Uber is um, probably um, speaking of the labor issue in France, right? That you explain at the, so right now there is nothing like the, um, I mean, the, the legal aspect, they haven't decided anything yet, but right now it's in litigation, right? That's what you explain. There's a lot of litigation and there's also uh, probably an upcoming legislation, but it will not be like in California or even in the UK. It will be providing uh, more benefits, insurance, especially in terms of uh, accidents. And when you cannot work because you had an accident, then the platforms will have to pay for your insurance and for you, the work, the, the days you cannot work. So it's a sort of compensation scheme. So the platforms from the new legislation will have to pay a little bit more. And there will be a minimum uh, wage uh, guaranteed. So there will be a change in the algorithm. And there will be um, obligation for, uh, we call that social dialogue. So there will be elections actually in at Uber Eats and Deliveroo and the other ones. Um, and that will be in 2022. So elections where all the gig workers will have to elect some sort of representatives so that they can discuss with the platforms. So there will be a little uh, progress in terms of step-by-step uh, -step new legislation. That's what it's going to look like in France. Okay, thank you so much for the study and it's very interesting what you have accomplished. And, and please work. send me the, the Cornell study contact if you can. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone for the, the questions and thank you Leticia for the great discussion. If anyone has any other question, just um, contact Leticia. I'm sure she will be happy to answer all your questions about this, this research. Um, thank you all for joining today. Um, thank you Leticia. We hope to collaborate with you in the future again. Yes. The, it's been a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. You can see her email in the chat box. Yeah, I just mentioned my email. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. Thank you.